Good afternoon. My name is Eli Lehrer, and I'm the president of the R Street Institute. On behalf of R Street, I'd like to welcome all of you to this symposium. As an alum of Johns Hopkins University myself, I'm particularly excited to be hosting this event, along with Hopkins, at this gorgeous new facility. Uh, I'd like to thank our co-hosts, the SNF Agora Institute, President Daniels, Hari Han, and the rest of the team for being such gracious hosts here today at this new facility. It's a fantastic facility. Um, I cannot believe what a great job the architects did with it. And it is an enormous improvement over the glorious socialist confines of the East German Embassy, where I took my own classes at Hopkins. So, President Daniels, Hopkins, thank you very much for providing something that is not a former communist embassy. <laughs> Most of you know our street, but I wanted to talk briefly about who we are as an institution, why we're here, what we believe in, and what we hope to accomplish with this convening. Our street is an 80-person think tank located here in Washington, D.C., with full-time state staff strategically located in the West Coast, Texas, the Northeast, the Southeast, and the Midwest. Our views, and my views, are squarely the political center right. We stand for limited, effective government for a free society where public policy begins with freedom as its initial premise, and governments exist primarily as guardians of inherent and alienable rights, an inclusive society that provides a place, a voice, and equal opportunity for all people, and a just society that holds everyone accountable to the same laws. Long historical experience has shown that only liberal democracy, only liberal democracy, could build a society that achieves these ends. While you will see our street staff working on everything from opioid treatment to electrical grid modernization, and from property insurance to prison reform, we know that we can only achieve our goals in a system in which people select their leaders, and these leaders are held accountable to the people through a system of regular, fair, and honest elections. We come together now at a time when this ideal is under threat. Just a few hundred yards from where we are, a president who claimed to support conservative principles worked to overturn the results of an election. While their actions have not been as consequential or dramatic, groups and individuals on the left and in the mainstream media, most prominently a two-time candidate for governor of Georgia, have done at least as much damage by working to sow distrust and paint common sense reforms as sinister conspiracies. It's time for all of those of us who consider ourselves conservatives to say enough. I know, and my fellow conservatives know, that conservatives have better ideas, a better social vision, and the greatest chance of creating a better future for Americans. But we can only do this in a convincing way if we could sell people on our vision and defend it in regular, free, fair elections in which the people have confidence. And we can establish these elections only through the most traditional conservative value at all, belief in institutions. The United States has the longest standing single document constitution in the world and the longest run of free, at least by the standards of the days in which they were conducted, elections. Running these elections well, assuring that everybody has the opportunity to vote who is eligible, and that only those who are eligible are casting votes is the most sacred duty of any democratic state. And it is the job of conservatives, of all of those of us who consider ourselves conservatives, to defend these institutions. This convening that we are about to begin is for 2023 the capstone of a year-long series of efforts we've conducted largely behind closed doors. From Utah to Indiana to Texas, we've run together conservative elected officials, grassroots leaders, scholars, and others to discuss, debate, argue, and disagree about elections. We've worked to condense what people have said, learn what the best thinking is, and bring it to you. At this convening, I hope we'll continue this process, continue to debate, discuss, and learn from each other, 
and work towards building a reasonable, sensible, conservative agenda for elections and voting reform that restores confidence in elections, builds strength in institutions, and upholds the key norms of liberal democracy. That's our goal. That's our mission. And I'm proud to be here with all of you today. I'm proud we've assembled this august group. I'm looking so forward to this discussion. And with that, I will hand it over to the two people who have done virtually all of the real work, Matt and Scott. Over to you. Thank you, Eli, for your words and for your leadership at the R Street Institute as we've undertaken this project over the last uh, year. I'd also like to take a moment right off the top to thank Scott for all of his hard work on this project for uh, well over a year, uh, along with my predecessor, Jonathan Bidlack, who worked tirelessly uh, on this endeavor uh, since the beginning. Also, would like to thank all of the staff at SNF Agora and R Street who have been working to put this particular event together. You've done a fantastic job, and I appreciate it. Uh, we all do. Uh, my name, as Eli mentioned, is Matt Germer. I am an elections fellow at the R Street Institute and the associate director of the governance program there. Um, and I'm excited for today. Uh, for those of you who have been part of this process all along, uh, you know that we have had over one year of convenings behind closed doors uh, and off the record as we've discussed a conservative agenda for democracy. Um, these have been convenings beginning originally here in Washington, D.C. last fall. Uh, continuing in the spring into Utah and into the summer and fall uh, in Texas and Indianapolis. Uh, this is now our fifth convening, uh, and, and we have already met for those who are, who are joining us just now today, uh, yesterday as well, to continue this conversation. This today is a, is a uh, small pivot in the work that we've done thus far. All of our previous convenings have been off the record, and today is our first conversation we will have uh, on the record, in the open, to discuss conservative principles for building trust in elections. And I'm excited to introduce those uh, to, to the world today. Uh, this, they, they are derived from our convenings. These are not the ideas of me or Scott or any individual one person, but instead uh, are the product of a, a synthesizing uh, over a year of conversations with folks on the center right. Uh, in particular, those, the, those folks who have participated um, I across the country include chief election officials, local election officials, legislators, activists, scholars, and media who all identify somewhere in the uh, spectrum of the center right. Uh, these conservative principles for building trust in elections are not just a declaration of what we've learned, but today is also the beginning of an effort for the next year to share these principles and to implement these principles uh, as we pre prepare for the 2024 election and beyond. Um, so as I hand over the mic to Scott, I once again want to thank him in particular for the efforts that he has done putting this event together uh, and, and for being uh, such a key figure in, in sparking this conversation. Thank you to, to Matt and thanks to all of you and thanks we are so grateful that all of you have joined us, many of you yesterday. Uh, we're hoping that the conversation is iterative today and, and on the live stream as well. Uh, and just wanted to start out with, with a thanks to, to Eli and, and Matt. It's been fantastic working with the, the R Street Institute. Um, we're excited to be uh, sort of your MCs for the day, but apologize that we did not uh, we did not synchronize or we did synchronize our suits. So apologies on that that you have to deal with with two blue suits, but we won't be up at the same time. Uh, but it's been it's been a fantastic partnership um, for us at the Aurora Institute, and it's been it's been a great journey over the, the last year. Um, I'm Scott Warren. I'm a fellow at the SNF Agora Institute. Um, have worked closely with with Matt and his predecessor Jonathan and Eli and, and the R Street team and and many folks behind the scenes who have done great work in terms of putting this together that we're incredibly grateful for. Uh, just a, just a few opening um, remarks to sort of set the stage for today. So um, the SNF Agora Institute was was founded in 2017 with the aim to really strengthen global democracy through powerful civic engagement uh, and informed inclusive dialogue. And the name of the Agora is is purposeful. Um, it's from from ancient Athens, Greece, and the Agora was a form of, of structured debate, disagreement, dialogue, deliberation. Um, and, and this specific initiative, uh, a conservative agenda for democracy and exploring what that means, I think is, is really privy and, and parcel to the mission of, of what Agora 
has been trying to, to do, and so I've been privileged to be a part of it. There's three main reasons uh, I feel privileged and, and, and we want to push this work forward, so I'll, I'll quickly go through them. First, a quick, and, and many of you have, have heard this, but a, a quick story of how this came together, which I think is relevant. So we're organizing some, some off-the-record convenings in the democracy reform space, what's working, what's not, bringing together uh, what we thought was a diversity of stakeholders to have a candid conversation. Um, we had our first one about a year and a half ago, thought it went well thought people had really rigorous debate and dialogue, uh, and afterwards a few folks, including uh, Jonathan Bidlack from, from the R Street Institute, came up and said that was a really interesting and inspiring and candid conversation, and 90 or 95 percent of the folks in the room were progressive, uh, which I think happens in a lot of democracy reform conversations. Uh, that It tends to be dominated by folks on the left. We cannot have a robust democracy sphere uh, if it is dominated by only one party. Um, there is no party that has a monopoly on democracy, um, and so that's what we've been, we've been trying to, to push here. The second, and we'll get into this in our first uh, panel, is we at, at Agora are excited to use research in an actionable and applied way. Um, and so that's part of what we want to do at the Institute, and we'll show you some, some survey data um, from Gallup today uh, that provides a real glimpse into uh, election trust and the distinction between conservatives that believe that Biden won the 2020 election versus those that believe that Trump won. Uh, third, uh, I just want to say a little bit more on the spirit of this initiative to date, which has been off the record. Uh, and <clears throat> I think that's been really important. Um, I think one of the theories of change that we bring to this specific initiative is the need to have real debate, discussion, uh, and, and especially with, with this group of people, it's been really important to do that. And so uh, it's been uh, really fascinating to be behind these doors, um, as we said, in D.C. a year ago, in Utah, in Indianapolis, in Texas, and yesterday here today, to really have a robust debate on, on what it means to actually uh, have a conservative agenda for democracy. And then at some point, that needs to be public. And that tension is something that we're still grappling with. It's not like we're going to tell you everything that's been said behind closed doors. Uh, but we do want to figure out how those conversations and that wrestling and that grappling can actually translate into real action. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do today. This whole thing has been an experiment, and so we'll see how it goes. And we welcome feedback throughout, too. Um, but we say that uh, with candor and humility. Um, and with that, I'm honored to introduce um, Johns Hopkins University President Ron Daniels. Uh, he is Johns Hopkins University's 14th president. He's been at the helm since 2009. Uh, at JHU, he has strengthened interdisciplinary collaboration in research and education, uh, enhanced student access, deepened engagement with the city of Baltimore, and now working to do so in Washington, D.C. with this gorgeous building, um, and supported economic and social innovation. Um, he's a prolific writer. His most recent book is very relevant to did today. Uh, it's called What Universities Owe Democracy, Focus on the Indispensable Role that Universities Play in Sustaining Democratic Societies. And with that, I'd like to welcome President Daniels to the stage. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Scott. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to help you kick off this event and thrilled, truly thrilled, to be able to have you here at our new Hopkins Bloomberg Center. This gathering, I think, provides strong evidence that the words conservative and university need not be, in fact, antithetical terms, as so many across our country are inclined to think. And I could imagine a more perfect, a more ideal space for this convening than this one. After we purchased this building in 2018, we just redesigned it from the outset, in keeping with the spirit of its former occupant, the museum, as a place that could support democratic society in a number of different ways. We hoped that this would be a place that would produce ambitious scholarship, that educated the next generation of leaders and thinkers, and the convened gatherings and participants that would represent a broad range of disciplines, fields, and critically, perspectives. Gatherings like this one, these commitments to serving democratic aims are, as we all know, more urgent than ever. As, again, you know so well, democracy itself, I think, faces very significant challenges, if 
uh, if not in some cases indeed existential challenges, both here in the United States and across the globe. According to the Varieties of, Democ of Democracy Institute, the share of the world's population living in democracies has in fact plummeted in the past decade from 54 to 28 percent. Recently, we crossed another troubling threshold. For the first time in 20 years, closed autocracies actually outnumber liberal democracies. In our country, of course, we're also seeing an increasing lack of faith in the integrity of elections, which, as a poll you're discussing today shows, is especially prevalent among Republicans. The work of restoring and rejuvenating democracy at this point must in fact be a collective effort that transcends partisanship, and we understand that this is not an easy task. To quote another sobering statistic, in the last 60 years, the share of Republicans and Democrats who say they would be upset if one of their children happened to marry a member of the opposing political party has skyrocketed from about 5% of the population to now 40%. Again, another sign among many that Americans increasingly regard those who hold opposing political views not as fellow citizens, but as enemies whose ideas are to be feared and silenced. This is obviously fertile ground for authoritarianism to take root. But your conversations in this convening demonstrate the promise of what is possible when we commit to vigorous and rigorous exchange of ideas to advance understanding and engagement for the public good. That principle, I believe, lies at the heart of universities, and it also lies at the heart of conservatism, or should at least. Nearly 70 years ago, William F. Buckley published his first issue of the National Review. In his mission statement, Buckley stated that behind all political institutions are moral and philosophical concepts. But these concepts are not, in his words, the product of day-to-day -day guesswork, expedience, and improvisations, but of ideas and more ideas. Buckley insisted, have to go into exchange to become operative. Buckley founded National Review as a vehicle through which to circulate conservative ideas and arguments. That same impulse remains essential in our moment. It is more important than ever that principled pro-democracy advocates across the political spectrum be given spaces and opportunities to articulate a positive vision for the future of this singular form of popular self-governance. We may not agree on all the particulars of that vision, how to achieve it, or what the policy outcomes should be, but we can agree that certain core principles, facts, and foundational ideas, and we need those ideas to remain operative. I look forward to learning more about the fruits of your conversations and to seeing the future actions that they will yield. Thank you again for being here and thank you to Hari Han, the, the head of Agora, Scott and Eli and everyone at the SNF Agora Institute and R Street for making today's event possible. And now I believe uh, we have a video message from Utah Governor Spencer Cox and with that I say roll film. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Utah Governor Spencer Cox. I'm sorry that I'm not with you all in person today, but in April of this year, I was grateful to be part of a group of conservatives from across Utah and across the country who came together to explore a conservative agenda for building trust in elections. I'm pleased that today offers more of a public exploration of what the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins and the R Street Institute have been exploring and leading across the country. In my role as governor of Utah and as a citizen, Citizen, I care deeply about improving our democracy. To that end, as chair of the National Governors Association, I've been spreading a message of disagreeing better. By that, I, I don't mean that we need to be nicer to each other, although that's helpful. The fact is we all need to learn to disagree in a way that allows us to find solutions and solve problems instead of endlessly bickering. It's the only way that our democratic republic can function. This message applies to all of us, Republicans and Democrats, and everything in between. The conservatives in this room can show the country how we're building trust in elections by demonstrating key areas of agreement and the way meaningful disagreement is inspiring policy ideas to make our elections work even better. Voters need to understand that there are conservative election officials and experts all across the United States who believe our elections are, at a baseline level, legitimate, even though counties and states have some differences in how they do things. They all have the basics in common. 
testing every voting machine to ensure they are secure, conducting audits of ballots after every election to confirm the results were accurate, and storing paper ballots in secure facilities so there is always a paper trail and that audits and recounts can be conducted. Whether you live in a blue county or state or a red county or state, this is generally how it's going to work and it works well. And where differences among jurisdictions do exist, they provide us the opportunity to continuously improve elections. Elections can't be perfect, but today is an example of how we're always working to keep them getting better. Today, you will discuss some of the best practices for how to build trust in elections, which will help us all do our jobs better and provide voters the assurance that we're constantly trying to deliver an election system that works the absolute best it can for them. Conservatives should remember our elections are for every eligible voter, no matter who we choose to support. As a conservative, I believe that we should always work to make constitutional rights more accessible, not less. I'm proud of the record we built doing that in Utah, and I'm excited to be part of a group that's making it happen all across our great country. Great, thank you to <clears throat> President Daniels and to Governor Cox. Um, I'm now excited to have our first panel come to the stage, which is going to focus on exploring the research around the state of election trust. So we're gonna have Hari Han, the inaugural director at the SNF Agora Institute, uh, moderate, and she'll introduce the rest of the panel. So thank you all. And there'll be time for Q&A too, so Sorry. you can get your questions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really good to see you all here. Thanks so much for being here. I'm really delighted to um, have you all here. I know that um, there's been some really good conversations over the past couple days, and so thank you for joining us. Um, I'm really excited for this panel. Um, the panel is about the state of election trust, and um, we have three terrific speakers, I think, who are going to talk us through lots of different dimensions of that question of what trust is and how we understand it. Um, what do we know? What do we not know? Um, how can we build it? Um, whose trust? How do we understand what trust is? Um, matters most, and so on. Um, so first, I'm just going to briefly introduce us, uh, introduce, sorry, the panel. Um, Sarah Fioroni is a consultant at Gallup, leading um, re original research projects using US-based public opinion polling. She's a PhD in communications and media from the University of Michigan, where her research focused on media effects and political identity. Um, Mindy Finn is a founder and CEO of Citizen Data, which is an applied public opinion research firm that has done extensive work on issues of democracy and trust in elections. Um, and Charles Stewart III is a distinguished professor of political science at MIT and the founding director of the MIT Election Data and Science Lab, which applies scientific principles to how elections are studied and administered. So please join me in welcoming our entire panel. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to start with, um, Sarah's going to share with us some data from a recent poll that um, she and her um, collaborators have um, run. Um, and then um, we'll have a discussion with Mindy and, and Charles and, and Sarah. Um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A for the audience. And so we're really hoping that we can have a robust discussion. But we'll start with Sarah. Thanks. Good afternoon. I'm very excited to be here to speak with you all. And I'm going to kick off the panel by giving a very brief overview of the study that we conducted in partnership with the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. The study focused on confidence in US elections. It was fielded in October using a non-probability opt-in panel of US adults. And beyond collecting general baseline metrics on the state of confidence in elections going into 2024, one of our main research goals was to explore diversity in thought and opinion among conservative voters on this topic. As such, at the sampling stage, we targeted and oversampled Republicans, conservatives, and conservative-leaning independents, particularly looking for conservative conservatives who believe Biden won the 2020 election. Recruiting this particular group was a little bit challenging, but we were able to get enough sample to explore different characteristics, beliefs, and opinions that distinguish conservatives who believe Biden won the 2020 election from those who believe Trump won. And these are the results that I'm going to focus on today. So let's start with opinions about the 2020 presidential election. This election, of course, was pretty unique. It was a rare instance of widespread skepticism and opposition to accepting the verification of the election results. In other words, it really divided the country, it divided conservatives, it divided the Republican Party. 
We found that about six in 10 Republicans and Republican-leaning independents believe that Trump won the 2020 election. About a quarter of Republicans believe that Biden won, and about 12% are unsure. Democrats have significantly less diversity in thought on this topic. The results of the 2020 election, naturally, the majority believe Biden won. But as I mentioned, the main goal of this study is for us to better understand these differences between the 62% of Republicans who believe Trump won from the 38% who believe Biden won or unsure and how they think about elections in, in the context today. So how we went about this was we divided our sample into three groups. The first group, which we call conservative Trump, are Republicans, conservatives, and right-leaning independents who believe that Trump won the 2020 election. The conservative comparative group, which we're calling conservative Biden, are the Republicans and right-leaning independents who believe Biden won or they were unsure about the 2020 election results. Finally, that leaves our third group, which is the rest of our sample, which included Democrats, liberals, and left-leaning independents. To start, we looked at different personal characteristics, attitudes, behaviors that might distinguish the two conservative groups. A couple of important factors stood out. The conservative Trump group is slightly more race, racially homogenous, mostly white, and they're more strongly connected to their identity of being Republican and say that that identity is important to them. The conservative Biden group, on the other hand, was slightly higher educated, slightly wealthier, and generally they were more moderate when it came to ideology and had less of a strong emotional connection to their political identity. Conservatives who believe Trump, Trump won the election are slightly younger, more religious, more likely to own a gun. The conservative Biden group was slightly older, had higher interest in news, and interestingly were more likely to say that they talked about politics with a good mix of Democrats and Republicans. Conservatives who believe Biden won the 2020 election also had higher levels of trust in local government, the Supreme Court, and science broadly. So here's just a little bit of a picture of what's going on behind the scenes between these two groups. Now let's look at how attitudes about U.S. elections vary by the three groups in the sample. We asked respondents to evaluate their level of trust across a couple of different factors related to election security, accuracy, integrity, and there are a couple of areas where conservatives had a pretty significant departure from one another, depending on whether they believed Biden or Trump won the 2020 election. These areas were accuracy of counting paper ballots, accuracy of the electronic voting machines, whether or not voters are facing obstacles to vote, and the promptness of counting and reporting ballots. These are the areas where the conservative Biden group had much higher levels of confidence than the conservative Trump group. In fact, the conservative Biden group in these areas was a little bit more aligned with Democrats and liberals in their level of trust. The conservative Biden group did express some low levels of confidence, though, when it came to accuracy of counting mail ballots and the prevention of voter fraud. There are two additional things that I want to highlight on this slide. First, if you look across the screen at the red dots, you can see that it's pretty consistent that conservatives who believe Trump won the 2020 election have low trust in basically all areas of election security and integrity that we measured. But importantly, if you look at the bright blue dots as well, which represent the Democrats and liberals in our sample, you can see that while their level of confidence is higher, it's not universal. Across these different aspects, in most cases, we had only about half of Democrats and liberals saying that they trust the system completely or a lot. This pattern of results is what we're going to see throughout the rest of our findings. In some areas of election trust, conservatives are aligned. In some areas, they aren't. So for example, when we look at trust in elections in your own state versus other states, we find that, of course, among the conservative Trump group, trust is much lower. But the pattern remains the same across the three groups. There is greater trust in the integrity of elections in your own state than your perceptions of election integrity in other states. Now, when it comes to how much conservatives value accepting the outcome of an election regardless of whether their candidate wins, this is where we saw some differences. The conservative Trump group is about split 50-50 on whether they say it's important to them to accept election results if their preferred candidate loses. On the other hand, nearly four in five in the conservative Biden group say that that is important to them, and this is a little bit more aligned with what we're seeing with Democrats and liberals. 
We also asked about concerns regarding misinformation in US elections. Conservatives who believe Trump won the 2020 election are the most concerned about misinformation when it comes to elections. That said, about 30 to 40 percent of Americans, regardless of their political affiliation, are very concerned about misinformation in elections. And given this level of concern about misinformation and considering what happened during the 2020 election, this has made the case even clearer for the importance of sources of information when it comes to election security and verification. So here we find that the conservative Trump group is more likely to say that they rely on social media and family and friends for election news than conservatives who believe Biden won. And conservatives who believe Biden won the election were more likely to say that they turned to television to get election news. Now that we have a better sense of how different conservatives feel about the state of, of elections in the US overall, let's look ahead to 2024. So there's gonna be a lot of data on this slide, but I will walk through it. We asked survey respondents whether they think Republicans or Democrats will accept the 2024 presidential election results if their party loses. As you might expect, when respondents are considering their own political party, they're more likely to say that their party will accept a losing result, as opposed to when they evaluate the opposing party, they're more likely to say that they wouldn't accept a losing result. There are some interesting differences that, that play out here. First, Democrats are more likely to say that Democrats will accept election results than Republicans say that Republicans will accept. What's interesting here is a lot of conservatives believe or say that they're unsure about whether Republicans would accept a losing election result in 2024. Now looking at the conservative Trump and the conservative Biden groups, they feel very similarly when evaluating their own party. If you look at the Republicans accepting a losing result, they're a mix of unsure or they believe Republicans would accept this result. But when we get to conservative perceptions of Democrats, we see a big difference. More than half of the conservative Trump group believes Democrats would not accept a losing result in the 2024 election, while only a quarter of the conservative Biden group believes so. The conservative Biden group is more likely to say they're unsure if Democrats would accept this, a losing result in 2024 or to say that they believe Democrats would accept a losing result. This is all to say that there is a healthy amount of skepticism across the board about whether a, the election results in 2024 will be accepted. The American public is mostly unsure and probably bracing for contention. And what we see here falls along traditional party lines. Democrats are the most concerned that Republicans wouldn't accept a losing result, and the conservatives who believe Trump won the 2020 election are the most concerned that Democrats will not accept a losing result. How I'd like to lead us into the panel talk today is by emphasizing that just like confidence in most U.S. institutions, right now we're seeing a lot of distrust across the board in U.S. elections. That said, when it comes to interventions that might help build confidence in elections, we do see some meaningful differences on where different conservatives lack trust. Conservatives who believe Biden won the 2020 election have greater confidence overall in the system, but they are more aligned with their fellow conservatives who believe Trump won the election in being very worried about voter fraud. Now what's interesting is conservatives who believe Biden won the election in 2020 are a little bit more aligned with Democrats in worrying about voters facing obstacles to vote or intimidation when they go to vote. Conservatives who believe Trump won the 2020 election have very little confidence in the accuracy of counting, no matter the format, mail, voter machine, etc. They also are the most likely to think that the opposing party is trying to cheat in the election, and this is the group, again, that is most concerned about misinformation. Now, lacking trust in elections is, of course, not just a conservative issue. This study found that less than half of liberal and Democrats say that they can trust a lot, that voters are not facing obstacles, and that ineligible voters are being prevented from voting. All this is to say, tailoring interventions to target some of these particular areas may be critical. And with that, I know that my fellow panelists have done a lot of work on this topic, and I'm excited to hear their perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, that was great, and um, really helpful to sort of ground us in a lot of data to begin the discussion. Um, 
Mindy, I want to bring you in because I know your organization has done so much work um, thinking about sort of message testing um, on election trust. And so, you know, given the kind of baseline findings that um, Sarah has shared with us, um, I'm curious if you could share a little bit about what you all have learned um, from all of your work on ways in which we might change people's sense of trust or not um, in the election. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so, yeah, my our organization has uh, been researching this for the last few years. and. Um, we started to get a better understanding about how to approach this from an audience first perspective, um, which I know Sarah touched on a lot, yeah. sort of the various you know, oversampling conservatives for, uh, and this convening obviously is focused on conservatives because there really are you know, distinctions and that's really important to not only think about kind of even conservatives, but who among conservatives are actually movable on this issue. So mm -hmm. that's one of the big things that we focus on. We think of it from like a communication plan perspective. There's communication approach and there's a policy approach. And I like in these principles, you know, here that everyone has on their desk, which I think come from you know, partially at least some of the work we've done, we recognize there are those two components. There's the communications and the policy, and the two really go hand in hand. And on the communication side, understanding who is actually persuadable, who is movable, is really the first step. And I think Sarah started to kind of unpack that. Um, the other thing then is obviously message, and this is where kind of policy and communications combine. We see that these concerns, you know, for, for conservatives really and across the board, as Sarah talked about, transparency being emphasized is really important. Um, the understanding that these elections are transparent when it comes to election officials, you know, obviously elevating the role that of election officials without um, kind of lionizing them. So making clear that they are everyday Americans like you and I who are just here to serve the community. Uh, lifting up their nonpartisan credentials is really, really important. So some of, those are some of the key things from a message perspective. And then um, I don't want to kind of give it all away because I know we're going to have a discussion, but then <laughs> also on the, on the messenger's side is kind of really the next piece. I mean, there's several pieces of this that are all part of a, a, a um, impactful communications plan, but on the messenger's side, um, audience, of course, is really important, but one of the things that we identified, which was a surprising finding, some of our work in Georgia and Arizona, and it seems to hold true across all other places that we look, is that firefighters and first responders are some of the most trusted um, messengers in a, in a community, which I think really, I mean, isn't surprising from a um, kind of general perspective, but when it comes to trust in elections, I think a little bit surprising. That even when it comes to building trust in our elections, having kind of first responders as messengers um, are most trusted. We know politicians are largely not trusted unless it's a particular politician that an individual really trusts. For the most part, they're not, um, but first responders really uh, high up there on that list. That's so interesting. I want to bring Charles in the conversation, but just one quick follow-up question. So when you say, talk about the audience segmentation, the idea that there's an unmovable portion and an immovable portion, can you just, how big do you think each of those proportions are? Do you, do you guys have estimates of that? <clears throat> yes, um, we do, and, and you know, it's, it's, a, there's a, a spectrum on that as well. Um, there's the people that, um, you know, truly have, just don't pay as close attention. They're low information voters, so they might be low information, low trust. Um, and uh, they can be persuaded because they're, you're filling a container that this currently isn't filled. Um, and then there's the people who uh, may have attachments. Mm -hmm. You know, they, um, they already have a, have a position, it's just not strongly held. Mm -hmm. And so they can be persuadable as well. Um, from our research, let's just look at conservatives. You know, we find that um, 30 to 40 percent of conservatives are persuadable at some level. Mm -hmm. um, some are just more movable and persuadable than others, given, you know, whether they're already attached to one perspective or not. Um, and I'll just kind of go a little deeper on that, and it's why you, know, you look at some of the top line data you know, that Sarah presented, and you see otherwise, and it says who trusts the you know who are those that trust the 2020 results and who don't, like who think Biden was legitimate president, and who doesn't, and we look at that and we take that. Um, kind of binary, you know, um, to heart, and that's what we're sick with. But when you get to, when we're trying to move the needle, we really need to understand at what level of intensity do they hold that belief and why. Right. Um, and if they hold it just because, okay, Donald Trump is the effective head of our party, and he tells us this, so that seems like the right thing to answer, but like, I'm really not sure, um, that's how we start to understand we can move them. Interesting. Well, Charles, I know you've done so much work in this um, area, too, just on um, what voters actually know and what kind of um, what their perceptions are of different election security measures and so on. So I wonder if you can share some of your findings with us. Yeah, um, just just to, to begin to um, 
to dip into that. And then, by the way, thanks for in inviting me here. This is a, this is a great event. Um, after, um, so one, one of the things that I get to oversee is something called this, um, the Survey of the Performance of American Elections, which is a survey that we've been conducting after most federal elections since um, 20, uh, 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that, that survey came about um, in reflection on actually the 2000 election um, and, and, under, and a um, realization that a lot of the um, rhetoric around elections at the time, around 2000, made you believe that America was sort of like a banana republic. And we wanted to understand, see if that was the experience of voters. And in fact, that's not the experience of voters. V voters have very good experiences. And we've been documenting that over the last um, well over a decade now. Um, we had an opportunity in 2022 to ask voters questions about what they knew that um, um, about what state and local officials were doing to secure elections. This was um, 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 taking off on some work that had been done in Colorado. Um, there's a lot of appeals being made right now to doing um, a number of policy changes or administrative changes justified by the idea that this would instill trust by doing these things. Um, we wanted to know whether, in fact, voters knew what election officials were doing and whether we could get a sense in these very basic survey questions, whether um, knowing that um, election officials were doing things, it would raise their trust. So thing number one is that um, voters just do not know what state and local officials are doing. Mm -hmm. um, when you ask them, um, do you know whether or not your state and local official um, runs logic and accuracy tests or um, 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 keeps mail ballot or, or keeps paper ballots secure or verify signatures on mail ballots. Go down the list. We had about 13 different things. Um, majority of, of voters said um, no to all of those items. And a surprising number of voters said no to every single one of the items, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it turns out that conservatives, maybe not surprising, were much more likely to say that local election officials basically do nothing to secure the election. Um, but even so, liberals were only barely above half. Okay, so um, that's thing number one. Thing number two is that the things they believe election officials are doing, it can't be because they know it. And that is, um, for instance, Colorado, which does a lot on um, auditing elections and spends a lot of time um, telling voters about it. Only about 40% of people in Colorado know about post-election audits, know that they're doing it in, in Colorado. The second, most, second state where the most voters say their state does auditing, in fact, doesn't do auditing. <laughs> um, by the way, I should, I should mention, um, we have um, um, at least 200 um, respondents in every state, so we can actually, you know, we, we have a sense about, on a state-by-state -state level, how these things go. So, it's pretty clear in just looking at the responses and, and, and reflecting on them, is that the things that voters say that are being done are the things that sound like election, what an election official should be doing. So, if you call something, in fact, logic and accuracy testing is the thing that voters are the most likely to say that an election official does it. And I gotta believe that they really don't know that. It just sounds like something they should be doing. So very low, um, very low levels of, of knowledge about what's happening. Then we ask them, well, what would raise your trust in elections if you knew that your election official was doing this? And the sorts of things that, the good news here is the sorts of things that would instill trust seem to be the sorts of things that you would want election officials to do to run a good election, right? to um, audit, audit elections afterwards, mm -hmm. to have a solid chain of custody um, for your paper ballots, um, to verify signatures on mail ballots, things like that. Um, and, and it also turns out that these are things that are supported both by conservatives and liberals. So there are things that could get through almost any state legislature and um, would, it, would it be embraced um, widely. So um, we have other findings as well, but, but the thing that, that strikes me right now is that there is a lot of work to be done in educating voters. Another thing that we should talk about, by the way, is whether educating voters is really where we want to, uh, want to be spending our time, mm -hmm. right? Um, because uh, my sense is that 
a lot of the effects of distrust, yes, we don't like the fact that um, conservatives are distrustful of the election system that's corrosive on democracy. But it's not just rank and file um, election um, um, conservatives who are like causing trouble for election officials. It's highly motivated people. Um, and um, so I think we need to have a better sense about who it is that knows what election officials are doing and who it is, as Mindy was mentioning, is actually movable. Um, and in any case, um, what's the mix for election officials between communicating, the right mix between actually communicating on what they're doing and actually doing the good, um, the good work of um, election administration itself. So I'd love to pick up on where um, you left off, because I think that's kind of a theme that came out in um, a lot of the remarks that you all made, is this idea of, it, it, which in some ways kind of gets the idea of like, you know, what is the trust that we're trying to build, really? You know, is it that we're trying to convince the, you know, the, the movable portion? Is it that, you know, we are trying to, um, you know, fix holes in a system that is, you know, that, that, has, um, that has some holes, you know, or is it a more generalized trust in our politics or something like that? And I'm struck, Mindy, by, maybe I'll turn to you first, but invite others to jump in, um, by the finding that you all have about firefighters, you know, which we, you know, those of us in D.C. who work in this space probably don't conventionally think of firefighters as the people who would be, you know, ones that would speak on behalf of the election system, yet they're the ones that you all find are more trusting. So I'm just curious, you know, how you all think about that finding and what that means for how we understand what we should be doing. Yeah, you know, I, I think really um, that finding comes from the fact that there are so few trusted actors right. and mm -hmm. trusted leaders, um, they continue to be eliminated. So people who we would tend to have broad trust, um, their, the level in trust in those leaders has been going down over the years. So politicians continuously go down. Um, business even, you know, that's, business leaders are still pretty high, though like the type of business leader really matters, but even that's continued to go down. Faith leaders it can be, but it's like very individualized to particular communities. They trust their faith, faith leader and they don't trust others. And in general, religiosity and, and you know, religious um, attendance is going down. So there's just not many common trusted leaders uh, that you can elevate to move a significant portion of the public, which is, I think, one of the reasons that firefighters come up there. They haven't, they actually haven't been negated as a leader. It's not even so much, it's like that's who's left. It's almost, pro it's process of elimination. Um, I think finding, uh, you know, beyond that, it gets so tricky just because we have such a disaggregated information space. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the reasons this is challenging. The point about whether communication is um, something we should be focused on, I think one thing to be clear, it's, it's an unfortunate reality of the time when our elections have become so politicized. Right. So like the whole legitimacy of elections is a political issue. It's not just a public service issue. It's not just a civic issue. It has been so heavily politicized and there isn't really a counter, there hasn't been um, a counter infrastructure to the forces who are trying to politicize our elections in 2020, you know, Donald Trump and kind of Trump associates like made it a big, waged an entire campaign. And so instead of there being a counter campaign, what you, all you really have is this nonpartisan, you know, civic election infrastructure and, you know, others that are trying to plug into it, including many people in this room who are trying to take what is a polit you know, a politicized campaign to attack elections um, and trying to counter that through really a non an apolitical just mm -hmm. nonpartisan approach mm -hmm. at educating the public about what's really happening and so i think unfortunately there does have to be a communications effort um, and this is why election officials i know there's some in this room informers find themselves in this position unfortunately they're not political actors but needing to be counter disinformation um, leaders, they're needing to play that role, their departments have to play their role, but what we found is that's not enough. I mean, they can't do it on their own, and so it's also arming kind of an infrastructure around them um, to be that force that can run an effective, you know, broadly nonpartisan or cross-partisan um, effort just to instill or retain a level of trust in our, in our elections. Charles, I, I feel like part of what Mindy is saying about the relationship between the comms and the policy is related to what I, I, I've heard. You, you hinted at, you've talked about, I've heard you talk about, about the difference between trust and trustworthiness. Yeah. And so yeah. I'm wondering if you can bring that into the conversation. Yeah, so um, what difference between trust and trustworthiness. I mean, I think when we're, when we're in the area of communicating with voters, I think what we're thinking about there is basically changing a psychological state of, you know, kind of state. 
um, moving individuals from a, a distrustful state to a trusting state. And um, I think this is probably the most common way in which this larger set of issues has been framed over the last several years, and, and for good reason. Again, as I mentioned before, being distrustful of elections is corrosive um, for democracy, and, and that's a bad thing. But I think we need to be realistic about the ability of any communication strategy that election officials might do, that trusted messengers might do. We have to be, we, we have to be realistic about how far that needle can be. Um, can be, be moved, especially, and I spend a lot of my time talking with election officials, especially when it comes to election officials themselves. Um, so what can election officials do if the best they can do in communication is moving the needle just a little bit? Um, well, this gets to what I've been calling trustworthiness. And that is to say, um, trustworthiness I define as creating an election such that a reasonable person could judge whether or not the correct winner, in fact, was declared. Okay? Um, and we have institutions in society that are geared toward judging tr I mean, kind of the trustworthy institutions of courts and of canvassing boards and the rest. And one of the things that we do know in, in this research is, well, actually, one thing about history, one thing about research. One thing about research is that while um, an important thing in moving the psychological um, um, character, characteristic of trust, one, one important thing is who wins. Right, there's a winner-loser effect. When, pe when, when my candidate wins, I'm more trustful. When my candidate loses, I'm less trustful. But the other thing is my personal experience. We also know through a lot of research that when people have a terrible experience voting, or when they read about people have terrible experiences of voting, their trust goes down also. So in my talking with election officials particularly, who oftentimes feel um, kind of helpless in this environment, what I suggest is let's focus on the things that election officials actually have the most control over, and that is the actual administration of the elections. So it might be that election officials can only move the needle a little bit on the upper side, but we know in a poorly run election, the needle can be moved a lot on the negative side. Mm -hmm. And so as we're thinking about this entire set of issues, um, kind of instilling trust in the system, thinking about trustworthiness. What are the policies and the practices that make the result ironclad? And we saw the value of this in the 2020 election, when in places like Georgia, I'm looking at Gabe there, you could just say, here are the things we did. And um, you know, facts are a stubborn thing. And here are the things we did. And we saw that time and time and again. And I think in 2024, those fact-based institutions will also be standing there. And, and we, need, we can't overlook just running elections well as we think about what can we do in moving, moving the psychology <coughs> of the mass public. Yeah, Sarah. Yeah, I just wanted to add on that. You know, in the, the study that we ran, we actually included an experiment. I didn't have time to go over the results there. And honestly, most of the results were null results because it was a pretty limited survey experiment. But one thing that was interesting, I think, about this continuum that you both are speaking on is we did an experiment where we tried to prime people for different messengers of election verification information. Your state official, a national official, a community leader, a religious leader. What we found was these individual messengers didn't really have much difference between them. But just getting the condition of getting the information compared to the null mm -hmm. condition, we saw some movement. But where that movement was, was from the no confidence at all to a little bit of confidence, right? We're not talking about people moving from not having confidence to yes, I completely you know, believe that the elections are 100% accurate and secure. And I think that that's important if you look at a, you know, a five point scale, could moving from a five to a four be that all that's needed, mm -hmm. right? In order to change the tide, what is that increment that matters? Mm -hmm. So that was just another little interesting data point we found. It's really interesting that it's, and also it's interesting that it was like, it was just getting the information yes. about something happening, which is kind of consistent yeah. with what Charles, you're saying that like people just want to know yeah. that the stuff is happening, even if they don't really know what it is necessarily. So um, I want to open up, cause I'm sure we have some questions. Um, so I want to open up the discussion and I just realized I'm a little unclear 
if there's going to be mics or what the, oh, okay. So there are um, mics in the room. And so I think if you have a question, if you want to just raise your hand and someone can um, bring a mic over uh, to you. And so, um, Rachel? Is it on? It's not on, I don't think. I'm happy to speak loud. Right, okay, there, there we go. Yeah. Um, so thank you. This was absolutely terrific. Um, I just want to know, I come from the kind of Larry Bartle's Democracy for Realists school of thinking about this, having spent a decade uh, working campaigns. And I really wonder how much voters are claiming that they'll be moved by various activities because they know they're sort of supposed to be moved by different points of knowledge, but actually are more likely to be moved by um, the emotions of the society that they consider their society around them. So they're family, friends, their identity group. And if there's any way to better test that, because that would be a whole different persuasive strategy than trying to do actual things to persuade them. Mm -hmm. right. That's a great question. Um, I don't know. So yeah. I'll just I mean, make one small comment on that. So um, in kind of 20, 2020, 2021, we are doing a, a lot of work on kind of who is persuadable on election trust and where is the disinformation coming from, what impact is that happening, et cetera, et cetera. In parallel, we're doing a lot on uh, COVID vaccine hesitancy mm -hmm. among conservatives and particularly rural populations. And unsurprisingly, there's a lot of overlap in terms of those two things. Um, not exactly the same, but a lot of overlap in terms of kind of how it shifted, where people had an initial level of trust and it declined because key, spokespeople were telling them not to trust, right? And um, and the, the reason I bring that up is because something that was very well established on the COVID vaccine side that we've seen show up a bit on election trust, but I think there's more proof to, to be done, um, is just how powerful, like when no one else is trusted, so like put my firefighters thing aside, um, friends and family and personal networks were the most influential and really at like the last mile only influential kind of people who could who could move somebody, who could convince someone otherwise, um, because it's like every, everything else was viewed kind of as noise. And the reason that's, I think that's helpful from like a bit from what Charles was saying in that um, the importance of the personal experience, because it's the personal experience that's going to have that kind of echo effect on close friends and family. Um, it's less helpful when we think about a scalable strategy just because it is so challenging to break into a lot of the ways that people are communicating with friends and family through you know text group text chats and Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and wherever you know in person in person and and whatever else. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I think that's all to say that I think there's more work to be done or could be done to really get super granular, um, be able to bear out more the influence that close friends and family and really close social networks can have on influencing one's view on on elections. Kels, did you well, I, if you just say, I mean, I mean, one of the things, just to, to, to piggyback on what Minnie was saying, um, it's not only because I'm a, co a college professor where, where I would say more re re research needs to be done, <laughs> right? But this is an area in which there's a lot of claims made um, by policymakers, by advocates, et cetera. And we just don't know. We just don't know. Um, and I, I hate to say when we do know, there are null results. But we just need when to you do say that this is an area, do you mean the area of how to influence friends and family, or, or do you? Oh, I'm sorry, not not how to, how to influence friends and, and family, but on what to do in terms of policy and practices, right. and okay. what and, and yeah. how that can move might be able to um, influence um, the pe trust people have. We just right. don't know enough, right. um, mm -hmm. and we need to do more of that research. And there's folks in this in this in this room who are likely to do it, and we can work with and doing and doing more of. Um, Right, yeah, yeah. No, just want to clarify. Sarah, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add in terms of how you all thought about setting up your designs and, um, and, and this question that, that Rachel asked about how you might measure or study some of these things. Yeah, I mean, I think the nature of this question may not be best suited for like, you know, a standard poll of, you know, a thousand Americans, right? When you have a poll, you're trying to get a quantifiable scale of something. You know, there's obviously some desirability effect when people are answering questions. People are notoriously bad at predicting their own behaviors mm -hmm. and like what they're gonna yeah. do. And one thing, one area of work that Gallup has done is with the Knight Foundation and trust in media. And we have found that qualitative work has really helped us break open some of this mm -hmm. um, in conjunction with quantitative work. We asked people, in focus groups 
seriously, what would it take for you to trust the news again? Right? And we got some really interesting answers that you don't get in just a standard poll that you would mm -hmm. run. So I think there's a lot of ripe opportunity with research and mixed methods to dig into that more. Great. Um, I think we have other question in the back there. Hi. Are you concerned about uh, Republican lack of trust in polls in terms of your results, the so-called shy Tory? and how that impacts reaching the entire segment of Republicans that have issues on this? And then also, are you concerned about the durability of these interventions? Because I think a lot of your poll shows these people turn to friends and family and social media, and they may get some good messaging for, from a great group that's trying to change this problem, but then they're gonna go right back to Twitter and their friends and family and hear some more crazy things. So how do you think those two things fit together in understanding and solving <coughs> this problem? Sarah, do you wanna start? Yeah, I, definitely for, on the first question, I mean, uh, that's a reality with polling. It's, so there are certain populations that are hard to access. For us, it's not, it wasn't a matter of a challenge of getting um, conservative participants in our survey. We were really trying to get um, conservatives who believe Biden won the election. That was a little bit challenging for us to recruit into our survey, although we did have, I think, close to 350 or 400 in our sample, which is a lot and allowed us to look at the data in some interesting ways. Um, but that is, I mean, that's just a reality of recruiting. And there's other populations in the country that are hard to recruit to participate in surveys as well. Young people is one of them. Um, getting sufficient sample size for Asian, Pacific Island, or Native people to participate in surveys. This is an ongoing thing. I know Gallup, I'm sure, Citizen Data and others, we're constantly experimenting on how we can build trust around polling and get um, you know, greater participation of really important segments that might have some skepticism around polls. Um, so yeah, this is a this is a reality that we're constantly working on there. Right. Mindy or Charles, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add on on either of those questions. Uh, I mean, I'll, I can say something just on the on the second question. I, mean, I have a lot to say on on the <laughs> first question. The first being, don't trust the polls. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, the second is on the durability. I, I think it's it's a mm -hmm. really important question um, because this is a little bit builds on what I was saying before that we have to be realistic and what Charles is saying about it's not just how much you can move the needle with a particular message, but we need to think about kind of like what are the forces at play and if you have a massive political apparatus that's campaigning to politicize you know, elections as an issue, um, just need to be realistic about what kind of counterforce would even be required to, to kind of move the needle there and what's possible. Um, and you know that's kind of when you get to the point of, well, maybe it's not doing a counter campaign at the same level, but it is ensuring that um, it's not going to be symmetric, that the nonpartisan civic infrastructure across the country is running extremely you know, well, they have extremely well-run elections so that as many individuals as possible have an excellent experience. And yes, that election departments and election officials are armed with the communications tools required to address communication or disinformation challenges in real time. And increasingly, they are being given those tools. Um, so it's not to say you give up, but I do think you have to be very realistic, not just about, okay, we have the right message, but what is the volume that would be required? What is the persistent, persistent campaign that would be required to move the needle significantly? Significantly, and if that's not realistic, then we need to think about kind of what is the next best strategy. I also just want to add, you know, I think it's also important to distinguish measurable outcomes that are desirable from polling. I mean, polling is about how are people thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's very important, and it can be really predictive of behavior, but I think it's not the end all be all. We also need to think, like, what are the outcomes that we would want? Is it participation numbers of certain groups? What are some of those outcomes that you can use in combination with polling? Um, I think just whether or not people feel that they trust or not isn't sufficient. Um, maybe to get at that durability and understanding of how we're tracking success and failure. Great. Um, okay, I think there's a, I don't, I don't know if the mic runners have, okay, they have someone, sorry. And, I, and there's a question up here too, so just for the mic runners. Okay, but yes. Hi, uh, Daniel Stid with Lyceum Labs. Thank you for the, the great uh, panel here. A, a question about the, the, if any of your polling data 
uh, has teased out connections between either current levels of trust in elections or the potential to reboot that on the one hand with uh, respondents, you know, civic and social attachments on the other. And I, I think in particular, you know, the, uh, for, it seems like one hypothesis would be that the more isolated people are and the more they are turning to politics as the main source of their social connection and affiliation, that might make them especially vulnerable to mistrust if that's what they're perceiving through their political channels, but if they have some of these, you know, whether it's a membership in a rotary club or their churchgoers or other things, does that tend to reinforce or provide a channel with which to reinforce trust? I don't know if any of your surveys speak to that question. Sarah? Um, I mean, I, I think that you find that when people, when you have some measure of diversity of who you're surrounded by, diversity of conversation, diversity of people in your network, there's definitely some evidence that that might lead to greater trust and other types of pro-social behaviors and things like that. I think there's a lot of better academic research on this that shows that when people are not locked in an eco chamber, when they're exposed to people who have different identities, cultures, backgrounds than them, that some of these things have some needles that can be moved. I don't know if you all have some thoughts on that, but. Yeah, one, uh, I wish I had the numbers on the top of my head, but there is definitely, there's a couple pieces of research I can think of in the like 2021, 2022 timeframe um, who that did look at the connection between civic membership, civic attachment, and also civic knowledge mm -hmm. and levels of trust in uh, civic infrastructure or democracy, um, you know, certain leaders, the election, as I said, the vaccine work even. And, and so, um, Daniel, to, to, your, to your question, like there definitely there was a, there is a correlation, um, even more so I think in civic knowledge than civic membership, just because the levels of civic membership are so low now that there are more people who have civic knowledge than have some kind of high levels of yeah. civic membership. Yeah, and I, I seem to um, recall looking deep into to, um, Sarah's slides that there's some findings even there about, um, about civic knowledge. And certainly we've, we've discovered that, that people, both liberals and conservatives, who claim at least they follow politics a lot, um, seem to be less susceptible to kind of, yeah. kind of, um, kind of outrageous distrust of the system, if you will. Um, so, and you know, it comes around to a lot of the kind of the, the emotion in the distrust seems to be coming from populations of people who are disconnected from politics um, and are perhaps are seeing it as another kind of Inter if, if, if anything, another bit of entertainment to go along with other bits of entertainment um, to reinforce one, one's own identity. Yeah, like one data point is, you know, even just looking at tr the conservative Trump and conservative Biden group, the conservative Trump group had much stronger connection to their political identity. It was really important to them. But the conservative Biden group was much more likely to follow the news. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting, right? Like emotional attachment versus interest mm -hmm. and motivation around knowledge and things of that nature. Yeah. And I'll just jump in here and use moderator's privilege for a second on this um, particular question. Um, we have a project at the SNF Agora Institute where we looked at um, variation in what we call civic opportunity across America. So there are certain places that are really, that have, where there's lots of opportunities for people to get involved in their civic lives and their civic communities, and there are certain places where there really aren't. And if you look at that variation, holding partisanship constant, like partisanship in the neighborhood constant, um, and levels of disinformation, um, places with more civic opportunity were more likely to have lower, um, resistance to like the COVID vaccine and stuff like that. And so we haven't looked at it with election trust, but um, it, insofar as there are sort of interrelated constructs that are there, there certainly was that relationship if you think about it on the supply side. So I think we have other questions that are coming up. Thank you. This mic. Thank you. Uh, I noticed something that seemed paradoxical and I wanted to ask about it, which is one of the questions about particular areas of election distrust was on um, worry that eligible voters would face obstacles to registering and casting their ballots. Mm. And uh, as I read it, this is the one election distrust theme that is more often coming from the democratic or, or liberal messaging. It's the voter suppression theme. Mm -hmm. And as one would predict, it's also the one that most worries your democratic respondents. But the group that was most distrustful of this was the Trump won people. And I found that interesting because it seemed as if general layers of distrust, mm -hmm. sort of trumped okay. partisan messaging in this case. Is that a, a fair critique? Yes, absolutely. 
yeah, that one stood out to us as well, which is why it made the one sheet. Because we had seven <laughs> different ones, but we were like that one. And, and what's interesting is I think the conservative Biden group more follows that that storyline, because they have higher confidence than Democrats did on that one. But the Trump, Biden, tr Trump believers were still just so low. I mean, it just was so low across the board. And before yeah. the Democrats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I don't know. And there's one there with the mics. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. I was wondering, um, especially because of how important party identity, identity is to the uh, the conservative Trump group. I'm wondering if you uh, use in the Gallup poll use any way to differentiate between those who were saying that uh, Biden didn't win as a form of expressive responding or partisan cheerleading, and those who genuinely believe that no, uh, Trump actually won and the you know it was rigged. Yeah, we didn't get into that much detail. The question was very simple: just who do you believe won the election, Trump, Biden? I'm unsure. So we didn't get into that level of detail, but it would be really interesting too. If, if I can really quick, quickly on, on that one, and Mindy might have some experience with that. I've been spending the last four years trying to, try, trying to figure out whether there is the kind of this expressive or you know, true believer, and some other colleagues have as well. And I've come to the conclusion that there's very little, you, 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 can, you can't find the folks who are kind of, um, kind of rooting for the team but don't really believe it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, that's really hard to do. And so I've started kind of taking these folks seriously. Um. Mindy, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, to the extent, I mean, we have looked at it a bit. It is a small group um, because I think to Charles's point, take, whether they believe it because it's expressive or not isn't really, like, they still believe it and it's still the same kind of concern. I think what we tend to look at, though, is who could potentially be persuadable? Like, what's the intensity of a certain belief? And for some of those people, it is expressive. Um, for some people, they kind of maybe just aren't really sure. Um, but really what we tend to look at when it comes to Republicans and conservatives is there is this about, you know, 30%, it kind of shifts, you know, who tend to have more trust in the election. These are the people more likely to believe that Biden won or at least have more trust in 2020. They're more likely to say there's trust in 2024. I, I think the last thing I would kind of say on that um, just maybe to give, I don't know, either cause more confusion or make people feel um, a little bit better is that, um, you know, as we track this, and I think your research actually backs this up, um, from 2020 to, you know, the end of 2022, or sort of the beginning of 2021 into 2022, um, the, the number of Americans who say, who express trust in an election or believe that elections are trustworthy um, has been increasing. So yeah, we're starting off on a better point. Mm -hmm. It has moved for whatever reason we can attribute it to. Um, that kind of fever, that post-2020 fever has softened. Um, obviously, you know, we're not like, we're heading into another election and it could absolutely change. But I do think that's something important to take a look at. Yeah, that's probably a good note to end on. <laughs> a little tiny bit of optimism. So thank you so much for the great discussion. Thank and thank you.